Hello, everybody. I see from the chat, <laughs> things are working. Hi, folks. So it's 2 p.m., uh, and I think we'll, we'd uh, like to get started. Um, I'd like to begin with a few short introductory mar uh, remarks first. Um, first, uh, welcome to FIBAC's new virtual book uh, talk series. I'm Kevin Wisniewski. I'm the new director of book history and digital initiatives at the American Antiquarian Society. Um, for newcomers, welcome. Uh, the American Antiquarian Society was founded in 1812 by printer Isaiah Thomas. Uh, we are a research library and a learned society uh, located in Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, today's event is part of the program in the history of the book in American culture, also known as FIBAC, uh, and uh, the first in a series of monthly book talks. So welcome. Uh, each month, we will invite an author of a recently published monograph or digital equivalent uh, to share their work and answer a few questions uh, from those in attendance. Uh, before I introduce uh, today's guest, which we're, uh, whom we're all excited to hear from today, uh, Derek Spires, um, I wanted to give a quick overview uh, of the platform. Uh, we are currently using Zoom, but this is Zoom webinar, which is slightly different uh, than uh, the Zoom meeting uh, that many of us are used to uh, at this point. Uh, and there are two functions that I'd like to highlight. So first, uh, if you uh, move your cursor to the bottom menu bar, you'll see the chat function. And I've seen, I see that a lot of you have already kind of uh, found this function. You are welcome to use this. Uh, I'm going to be posting uh, helpful links periodically throughout uh, the presentation. Uh, you'll notice the first couple at the top of uh, the chat now uh, include a few helpful links. Uh, one is to the uh, American Antiquarian Society's virtual programs, which I'll repost at the end of the talk today. The second is uh, to uh, Derek's uh, uh, book, uh, The Practice of Citizenship's publisher page. So if you haven't ordered that book yet, you can go to the University of Pennsylvania Press and order that soon. Um, second, there is a Q&A function. Uh, anybody who would like to uh, submit a question to Derek uh, today will do so, uh, or should do so, through the Q&A function. Um, we cannot see or hear any of you, um, but I will be at the end of the talk uh, combing through those and uh, pitching a few questions to Derek. And I promise I will get to as many as possible uh, as time allows. Uh, there is also a feature in the Q&A function that allows you to vote questions up. So if you see a question that you would like answered, you have the uh, you have the uh, power to uh, raise that uh, to the top of the list. And I will be asking those questions uh, uh, sequentially that way. Uh, finally, uh, I want to let everybody know that this event is being recorded uh, for friends who uh, have not, uh, were not able to uh, be here today. Uh, the talk will be made available on the AAS YouTube channel. So please check that out. We have lots of other great stuff on that channel as well. Um, check it out. Um, and finally, if uh, you like what you see here today, uh, I do hope that you uh, will come back for more. Uh, I encourage all of you to sign up for our mailing list, uh, which... Uh, uh, I will uh, send via link uh, at the end uh, of our talk today via that chat function. Uh, it's quick, it's free, it's the best way to kind of stay on top of uh, what's going on uh, with the book history program at AAS uh, so you don't miss out on future programs. Um, again, the link will be in that chat. Um, you'll see that we have a lot going on at AAS even though um, you know, we're currently not there, <laughs> so, uh, but we will be soon. Uh, with that, um, I would like to introduce today's guest. Uh, Dr. Derek R. Spires is Associate Professor of English 
and affiliate faculty in American Studies, Visual Studies, and Media Studies at Cornell University. He specializes in early American, uh, early African American and American print culture, citizenship studies, and African American intellectual history. Uh, today, uh, he will be talking about his first book, The Practice of Citizenship, Black Politics, and Print Culture in Early the Early United States. Uh, and that was published uh, last year by the University of Pennsylvania Press. So again, I have the link up there. Check it out if you haven't already. Uh, the book's already received much praise. Uh, it has won the 2020 Bibliographical Society St. Louis Mercantile Library Prize and the 2019 MMLA Book Prize. Uh, Derek is a general editor of the Broadview Anthology of American Literature, and he serves on the editorial boards of American Literature and Early American Literature. Uh, his work uh, on early African American politics and print culture has appeared or is forthcoming in a variety of publications, including the African American Review uh, and the American Literary History. Um, not only is Derek uh, a great researcher and a great scholar, for those who have read his book already, um, he's also one of the kindest and most generous people you will ever meet. And, and that's where I want to end this today and hand it off to Derek. It is my great pleasure to welcome Derek Spires. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin, for that kind introduction and for arranging all of this. And I've had just a little bit of time on Zoom teaching, so I know how um, interesting working with this technology can be. Also, thanks everyone for coming out this morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you happen to be. Right now, I kind of just want to forego to talk and hang out in the chat, but I um, guess I'm going to have to do the talk first. So um, I also want to thank the program in the history of the book in American culture, American Antiquarian Society. And I want to name um, Jerry Ward Jr., who's hanging out in the chat somewhere, um, without whom I would not have taken this path. I would not have gone to graduate school or done any of this stuff um, if he hadn't set me on this way. Uh, I want to thank Nafisa Thompson Spires, my wife, um, the readers and editors at the University of Pennsylvania Press, my students and colleagues at both the University of Illinois in Urbana and at Cornell, and many, many more people. Um, you can read the acknowledgments and the list is kind of long. Um, but thanks everyone for coming out. Um, at its core, the practice of citizenship is about the questions and methodologies that emerge when we focus our analyses on the concerns Black writers made foremost and on understanding these concerns in the terms they set forth. Scholars of African American literature and print culture have been attending to the early Negro writings to draw on Dorothy Porter's foundational phrasing for decades. Carla Peterson, Elizabeth McHenry, Francis Smith Foster, Joyce Lynn Moody, Mary Emma Graham, and others have built on Porter to give us a robust sense of the print cultures emanating from a variety of collectives including mutual aid societies, religious and fraternal organizations, conventions, newspapers, literary societies, and labor unions. The field they help define is not just about the recovery of text or troubling the canon. Rather, they are invested in creating deeper and ever more fulfilling understandings of the expressive print cultures Black communities created across time. More recently, initiatives like the Colored Conventions Project, the Black Bibliography Project, the Program in the History of Black Writing and Black Self-Publishing Initiative here at AAS and others are enhancing our understanding of how robust Black print was and continues to be. These projects are teaching us that simply adding Black books to the range of objects book history takes up is woefully insufficient. Black books and Black print more broadly compel us to develop new methodologies, theoretical frameworks, and institutional structures. Understanding and learning from the wisdom and tactics articulated in black print is a matter of life and death for democracy in the United States and for black people, literally. As Kim Gallen argues in a recent essay titled, What the Mainstream News Media Can Learn from the History of the Black Press, quote, 
The history of the Black press reveals that speaking truth to power requires a more complex approach that depends on a commitment to not only routing out lies, but also combating injustice, end quote. What changes then? when we develop our understandings of democracy, citizenship, and print culture, to name a few fields, not only from the writings of those whose policies sought to restrict, enslave, and remove, but rather from those who time and again thought deeply about access, equity, and justice as baseline principles, not exceptions or incursions on private property rights. As Black activist Samuel Ringo Ward told a white ally in 1840, had you a colored skin from October 1817 to June 1840, as I have in this pseudo republic, you would have seen through a very different medium. What does it mean to see and do citizenship through a different medium? The practice of citizenship tells a story about how black writers theorized and practiced citizenship in the early United States through a robust print culture. It insists on exploring citizenship, not just from the perspective of law and its framing of black people and others, but also from the perspective of black Americans, not as objects of law or passively oppressed bodies, but rather as people constantly looking for ways to create new life and new possibilities. It is one of my book's implicit arguments that black writing compels book history and print culture studies to read differently, not out of surprise that black books and black theorists exist, but from a position that assumes there's a there, there. I joined recent work from scholars, including Martha S. Jones, Chris Bonner, Carrie Hyde, and others, and noting that citizenship talk was ubiquitous in Black print. A perusal of Dorothy Porter's Touchstone Early Negro Writings, published in 1971, for instance, reveals a collection of addresses on the abolition of the slave trade delivered between 1808 and 1815 that begin fathers, brethren, and fellow citizens or simply citizens. Martin R. Delaney dedicates his 1852 pamphlet, The Condition, Elevation, Immigration, and Destiny of the Colored People in the United States, to the American people, North and South, by their most devout and patriotic fellow citizen, the author. Frederick Douglass addresses his July 5th, 1852 oration to fellow citizens, even as he positions himself outside the nation. And many of the collective addresses Black citizens issued to various publics through color conventions were addressed to fellow citizens. This was not just rhetorical invocation, they meant it. As state policies and public discourse around citizenship were becoming more racially restrictive, Black activists articulated an expansive practice-based theory of citizenship as a set of common practices that included political participation, neighborliness, critique and revolution, and the myriad daily interactions between people living in the same spaces, both physically and virtually. From Absalom Jones of Richard Island's founding of the Free African Society in 1787, the year of the federal constitution, through Francis A. E. W. Harper's writing about Moronich and revolutionary violence in the Anglo-African magazine on the eve of the Civil War in 1860, black citizenship theorizing rejected definitions of citizen based on who a person is, a predefined subjectivity, in favor of definitions grounded in the active engagement in the process of creating and maintaining collectivity, whether defined as state, community, or other affiliative structure. Citizenship, in other words, is not a thing determined by who one is, but rather by what one does. We see this clearly in Absalom Jones and Richard Allen's A Narrative of the Proceedings of the Black People the first text registered with US copyright by black Americans as far as we know. Jones and Allen published narrative in 1794, partially in response to accusations of black theft, theft and extortion published in Matthew Carey's official account of the 1793 yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia. In a little less than three months, the fever killed between four and 5,000 people, or roughly, 18, roughly 10 to 15% of Philadelphia's population approximately 400 of them free Africans. An additional 20,000 or so fled the city, which was the federal capital at the time. Audiences gobbled up yellow fever narratives and variations of the general theme replicated throughout American literary history. Carey's account as the official chronicle spread widely through multiple editions and with the account spread the characterizations of some of the vilest of the blacks as thieves 
immune to the fever and symbols of desolation. Carrie's words are bad and the yellow fever was horrible. But rather than talk about the fever or the details of black activities, I wanna spend my time working through how Jones and Allen give meaning to these events. Their tactical deployment of print and how they develop neighborliness as a citizenship practice. What happened during the fever was not wholly unique to black experiences in ordinary times, just more extreme. That said, I also wanna signpost Raina Hogarth's medicalizing blackness, an excellent account of the intersections of race and yellow fever epidemics across time that was published as I was finishing the practice of citizenship. On a basic level, Jones and Allen's narrative provides a chronology of black work during the epidemic, beginning with Jones, Allen, and William Gray's voluntary efforts, including the Free African Churches answering Mayor Matthew Clarkson and physician Benjamin Rush's calls for assistance and accounting for the group's expenditures and disposal of beds. Jones and Allen even include a ledger. The pamphlet contest kind assurances from Rush and others of black immunity that were widely accepted as fact at the time. And they offer their firsthand observation of the fever's course in black patients. Allen contracted the fever, but recovered. William Gray contracted the fever and died. They note, Jones and Allen do, as critical race and public health research has reinforced that studies using white subjects as baselines are fundamentally flawed and dangerous. And they set out to counter partial accounts of the black workers because in Jones and Allen's words, many unprovoked enemies who begrudge us the liberty we enjoy are glad to hear of any complaint against our color, be it just or unjust. Responding to Carrie in the public style of refutation, a form that would have been familiar to contemporaneous readers, provided a vector for making broader claims against white America. Indeed, in their initial justification for entering print, Jones and Allen employed stylistic tactics from a black intellectual tradition of critiquing those who, as Philip Sweetly famous observes, view our sable race with scornful eye. And as Benjamin Banneker notes in his letter to Thomas Jefferson, those who have long looked on us with an eye of contempt. For both writers, the stated occasion for entering print provides a hook, but not the ultimate target for their arguments. The connection to Banneker in particular might run deeper. Jones and Allen potentially had access to Banneker's letter to Secretary of State Jefferson, which was printed in Philadelphia in 1792. Banneker claims in the letter, it was not originally my design to write a lengthy missive, but he maintains, having taken up my pen in order to send the almanac as a present, Banneker was unexpectedly and unavoidably led to respond to the racist claims Jefferson made in Notes on the State of Virginia. These claims include Jefferson's argument that the blacks, quote, whether originally a distinct race or made distinct by time and circumstances are inferior to the whites in the endowments both of body and mind, end quote. I have a disdain for the phrase, the blacks, henceforth and forever. Banneker sent the almanac in manuscript form, a sly nod to Jefferson's questioning whether or not Wheatley authored her poems. Noting, noting that he was unsure of bringing it to print. The letter itself excoriates Jefferson through the language of the Declaration of Independence. It was in the early days of the revolution, Banneker reminds Jefferson, that your aberrance of oppression was so excited that you publicly held forth this true and invaluable doctrine, which is worthy to be recorded and remembered in all succeeding ages. Sir, how pitiable is it to reflect, Banneker continues, that you should at the same time be found guilty of that most criminal act, which you professedly detest in others with respect to yourselves, end quote. Jefferson responded to Banneker, affirming his wish to see a plan for emancipation enacted, and Banneker published his initial letter and that response in pamphlet form. He also included the exchange in the almanac he would publish that year. The entire sequence of events shows Banneker cannily manipulating that print not only to publish an incisive anti-slavery pamphlet, but also to drum up interest in his almanac. Jefferson may have been Banneker's addressee 
and he was clearly one of Banneker's objects of critique, but it's just as clear that Banneker had larger goals in mind from the start. Whether or not Jones and Allen read Banneker's pamphlet or almanac that year, the resemblance in print and rhetorical strategy is striking. Jones and Allen's main thrust was not simply refuting Carey's specific charges. They were no doubt looking for ways to articulate their rage and frustration with white Philadelphia, to help their communities find meaning despite this backlash, and to seize the opening to deploy a different way of understanding blackness and citizenship. Historian Gary Nash conjectures that black relief workers may have seen themselves in the moment as good Samaritans, coming to the rescue when all the respected men of the community turned their heads. Imagine the bitter disappointment in finding out that black Philadelphians would not only not receive credit for their work, but they would become scapegoats for all of Philadelphia's failures. Yet beyond the allegorical value, the parable of the Good Samaritan and scripture more broadly offers a framework through which Jones and Allen forwarded neighborliness as a citizenship practice. It is the recognition of a shared condition between individuals that grounds a real sensibility that presupposes and affirms each individual as having equal moral worth, regardless of prior social, political, economic status, and that prioritizes mutual aid in neighborhood over profit in the market. In this sense, Jones and Allen's understanding of community, outsiders, and charity invokes less the Leviticus admonition to offer hospitality to strangers as strangers, and more an ethos intended to produce ongoing relations of neighborhood that include emancipation. Many of the cases they cite in their narrative mirror standard accounts of wholesale failure, only to subvert assumptions about who acts for the good and why. One such vignette features the actions of a poor black man set against two others. And this is a lengthy quote. A poor afflicted dying man stood at his chamber window, praying and beseeching everyone that passed by to help him to a drink of water. A number of white people passed, and instead of being moved by, their poor, by the poor man's distress, they hurried as fast as they could out of the sound of his cries, until at length a gentleman, who seemed a foreigner, came up. He could not pass by, but had not resolution enough to go into the house. He held eight dollars in his hand and offered it to several as a reward for giving the poor man a drink of water, but re was refused by everyone." End quote. The first half of this story follows a common pattern Carey, Matthew Carey employed in his pathway. Carey also mentions the plight of poor persons without a human being to hand them a drink of water, men of affluent fortune abandoned to the care of a Negro, and those whose money cannot procure proper attendance. Where Carey's and others' illustrations typically end with the person dying, and in some cases, the presence of that Negro signaling their utter destitution not that they were cared for, Jones and Allen offer a poor black man who came up and not only supplied the poor object with water, but also rendered him every service he could. The black man's story undoubtedly offers a direct rebuttal of, to Carey's assertions of black immunity. Above these evidentiary moves, however, the anecdote provides a more general theory of citizenship missing in Carey's account an imminent sense of responsibility uncoupled from social status or economic motivation. The man's actions demonstrate what Jones and Allen call a real sensibility, one revealed through an expressive language of conduct that compels him and other black citizens and relief workers to move forward, even as white neighbors hide or stand by. So I grew up Baptist, full disclosure. And when my Baptist eyes saw this anecdote, it just begged to be read as a parallel text to the Samaritan story found in Luke 10. Um, Jones and Allen never named that narrative, but they were ministers after all, and the structure aligns almost exactly. So what happens when we align the two? I'm gonna rehearse the parable here um, because the details matter. When a lawyer questions Jesus out of, about eternal life, Jesus responds with a question of his own, what is written in the law? The lawyer replies, thou shalt love thy neighbor, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy soul, strength, and mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. Jesus tells the lawyer that he is answered correctly, but not to be outdone, the lawyer asks a follow-up question, and who is my neighbor? 
Rather than answer the lawyer's question by describing the set of people whom the lawyer should love and implicitly need not love, and thus offer a restricted notion of neighborliness, Jesus offers a case study outlining the characteristics of the neighbor as the subject, sensible to another's suffering in action. As in Jones and Allen's vignette, the parable features an injured man in need of assistance. Respected community leaders and symbols of civic and moral good recognize the man's suffering, but go out of their way to avoid helping him. Instead, a Samaritan not only aids the man, but also ensures his safety until his recovery. The Samaritan discovers the neighbor in the injured man and becomes the good neighbor, the keeper of the law who will inherit eternal life because he acts as the neighbor rather than looking for the neighbor. Context matters. Jesus isn't offering a morality play. He's interpreting the heart of the law. What does the law compel us to do? What assures my citizenship in the community of faith? By extension, the neighborly practices Jones and Allen model are not a supplement to citizenship. They're not something you get a cookie for or a pat on the back for. They're what you're supposed to do. Rather, neighborliness gets to the heart of the kind of society Republican governance could produce, one in which citizens love for yourselves and for those inestimable, inestimable laws of human rights, as Benjamin Banneker puts it, leads them to feel a duty to apply the most active effusion of their exertions to ensure that all people have equal access to the benefits thereof. By 1848, Martin R. Delaney would convert this principle into true patriotism, what he calls, quote, an impartial love and desire for the promotion and elevation of every member of the body politic, the eligibility to all the rights and privileges of society, end quote. Or to bring us back to Jones and Allen's narrative, citizens have what they call a duty to do all the good they can for their suffering fellow mortals, and to do so on terms of equality, not condescending benevolence, because it is the best way to secure the good for all. Neighborly citizenship, as Jones and Allen articulated, is an implicit critique of the merger of ethics and market capitalism. As formerly enslaved men, Jones and Allen well understood that the market was never free, but rather an arena that rewarded and reinforced power, depending on who had control of the narrative. While confronting accusations of inflation, they ask, if it was natural for white people in Carrie's and others' accounts of the epidemic to abandon the nearest and dearest in the name of self-preservation, was it not more natural for relief workers who were already economically depressed and physically vulnerable to lay aside questions of fairness to strangers in the name of economic self-interest in a free market, especially when the state apparatus allowed it? Quote, had Mr. Carey been solicited to such an undertaking for hire? Query. What would he have demanded? But Mr. Carey, quickly after his election, left the city, end quote. Like Phyllis Wheatley before them and David Walker after them, Jones and Allen's use of the rhetorical question is as flawless as it is ruthless. Like those who follow, Jones and Allen note that the problem is structural, not individual or emotional. Jones and Allen's point is not to excuse price gouging, but rather, to point out that market logics would never be a sufficient guide for right action, especially when the state protected and excused white malfeasance as natural and understandable while condemning others as inhuman. Quote, we know as many whites who are guilty of theft and extortion, but this is looked over, Jones and Allen remind readers, while the blacks are held up to censure. Is it a, is it a greater crime for a black to pilfer than for a white to profiteer? Privateer, excuse me. The term privateer confronts the duplicity and outsized scale of official structures that legalize and encourage white theft. Just as a state's letter of mark authorizes the private citizen to approach foreign ships in a way that would amount to piracy under other conditions, state-sponsored whiteness excused white callousness while minimizing black risk and maximizing black criminalization. Over 50 years later, the State Convention of Colored Citizens of Pennsylvania would call anti-black racism a passport to power as they protested Pennsylvania's restricting voting to white men in 1838. Jones and Allen asked us to consider who gets called on to sacrifice in moments of crisis and whose sacrifices receive honor. 
At the same time, they revealed that no amount of virtue, public or private, could save black citizens from white betrayal and violence. We might ask with the family of Ahmaud Arbery, is it a greater crime for a black man to supposedly trespass than for a white to be curious? Indeed, many of the texts I treat in the practice of citizenship, from Francis Harper's poems to Frederick Douglass' speeches, recognize the willful denial of black life as a precondition of a beautiful white citizenship. I wanna close with a reflection on my own journey in the field and its connections to the theorizing processes the practice of citizenship outlines. Let's call it scholarly neighborliness. During the 2010 Early African American Print Culture Conference at the McNeil Center and the Library Company in Philadelphia, Francis Smith Foster expressed concern to my panelists and me that our use of European theoretical models might be obscuring how black writers themselves were theorizing their print practices. At the time, I was interested in how the Black State Conventions fit in the conversations around Jürgen Habermas's structural transformation of the public sphere. Were the state conventions an example of a counter-public in action? A print counterculture as Joanna Brooks and Paul Gilroy have defined it? Or were they in a more liminal space? What I called at the time a mesopublic. I was deeply engaged with the 2005 William and Mary Quarterly Forum on Alternative Histories of the Public Sphere, alongside a 2008 forum on democratic style in rhetoric and public, and public affairs. And I was trying to find language for articulating the relationship I saw emerging between black print, black intellectual traditions, and an American landscape that seemed determined to silence both. That forum and my reading of and around Harbor Moss was formative to my reading of early African American print. At the same time, Smith Foster's question revealed some very real limitations to this approach and any approach to black books and black print that does not take seriously how black producers understood their work and does not engage in the critical ethics of citation and representation. Her probing helped me realize that I was looking for terminology and theory to talk about an expressive culture that was producing its own theories and terminologies. This was, in fact, the principle that drew me to early Black writing in the first place, and a core principle of African American literary studies, from May G. Henderson's Speaking in Tongues and Carla Peterson's Doers of the Word, to Houston Baker's Blues and Horton Spiller's Mama's Baby. The turn for me was applying this principle to citizenship, a concept that had not traditionally been thought of as belonging to Black writers. In this framework, Black invocations of citizenship are less an appropriation of a discourse and more claiming ownership of one. Samuel Ringo Ward had already supplied the phrase, seen through a different medium, that aptly got to what the state conventions and Black print culture more broadly were about. Jones and Allen similarly offered expressive language of conduct and real sensibility as sophisticated concepts for understanding fellow feeling and republicanism. And William J. Wilson and Francis Harper drew attention to the sublime, not the beautiful, as a political aesthetic robust enough for critical revolutionary citizenship based in the work of fugitive revolutionaries like the rebels of Jamaica who forced the British to take emancipation seriously. The field has changed much since that conference in 2010, both in terms of access for some to digital and physical archives, and in terms of the critical apparatus around early African American print culture, an apparatus that Smith Foster, the conference's subsequent volume, and numerous anthologies and special issues have helped shape. Nazira Wright, Benjamin Fake Franken, uh, sorry, Nazira Wright, Ben Fagan, Britt Russert, and others are theorizing black print practices using the terms girlhood, chosen, fugitivity emerging from black print and black studies and doing so in ways that as Fagan posits, insists not only that we remember the people along with the print, but also that our approaches be shaped by the theories and practices developed by the black men and women who live with the print we study. This focus demands not just an attunement to the ethics underlying black print practices or the competing ethics underlying them, but also as Wright observes, a dedication to reading through and under the lines for, quote, what is not being said as much as what is being said, end quote. Their work involves not simply questioning what and who we study, but also where and how. 
the infrastructures that inform the work collective in the recently published Against a Sharp White Background, edited by Bridget Gilder and Jonathan Sinjin. In so doing, we have come to deeper understandings of African American print culture and literary history that are plural and that are not teleologically oriented to an eventual renaissance in Harlem. I tell this story and bring Wright, Fagan, Russert, Gilder, and Sinchin together here, not just because of their work's proximity to my own book, each published between 2016 and 2020, but because each of their formulations build on, builds on and explicitly acknowledges and cites work from Smith Foster, Joseph Moody, Carla Peterson, John Ernest, Gabrielle Foreman, Eric Gardner, and others, senior scholars who have helped create a generative, collaborative field, and who themselves built on work from Andrew Seale, Barbara Christian, Nellie McKay, Cheryl Wall, Dorothy Porter, and others. It is in this spirit of collaboration that I quote from them at length here, and that I continually name names throughout this talk. Part of what we see, part of what I see as my book's intervention is that there's power in acknowledging these roots and networks of polyphonic collective engagements. Black history, black book history didn't just grow, to borrow a phrase from Ishmael Reed's mumbo jumbo. It's been here for years, despite institutions that often dismiss the work. Yet these recent books register a flashpoint, if you will. This new work constitutes moments of literary critical citizenship a dialogic and dialectical process that begins with acknowledging and learning from the practices that have come before and forging ahead towards something new. I'm trying to end on a positive note. It's been a bit of a week already. So I'll leave you with this. To the extent that the practice of citizenship tells a story, is a story about the tensions between black citizens' creative struggle for a just society set against an ongoing national predilection to foreclose such possibilities through increasingly restrictive and violent legal and social practices. The continued pressure of such a volatile landscape forced Black theorists to rethink and rearticulate their relation to the state continually, resulting in a body of literature that offers some of the most incisive analyses of citizenship available today. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. And uh, I'm gonna take a quick gander at all the chats and claps and virtual hands, fantastic. Um, I wanted to jump in with a couple of uh, questions as all the thank yous continue uh, in the chat. Uh, I do wanna remind folks that the Q&A function is still up and running and I encourage you to submit those questions um, or otherwise you'll be stuck with those that I ask. Um, Derek, I have a few questions for you to kind of get things started, um, but I, I will quickly turn to uh, the Q&A forum here. Um, th first, thank you very much for all of this. It was wonderful. Um, you know at some point I'm, I'm going to probably ask you about uh, neighborliness because this is the thing that I really um, uh, is, uh, am continually hit by. Um, but I, I kind of wanted to just start with the, the title itself, you know, the practice of citizenship. Um, I know the, the talk uh, begins to kind of unravel what citizenship is and means, uh, 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 but I, I want you to kind of, if you could, unpack that a little more because we're, we're looking at a term that's complicated in, in, in so many different ways, but, but I think especially complicated because uh, you're writing about a time before the 14th Amendment. And uh, your book is really rich in, in kind of weaving uh, how different individuals and groups make meaning and, and make citizenship for themselves when uh, in a time that, you know, such isn't legally afforded to them. So maybe we can just kind of start talking about citizenship and, and what that meant to, to both individuals and collectives at this time. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, first off, shout out to my U of I colleague, Chris Reberg. The title comes from him. <laughs> um, it's one of those things when you're finishing a book and one of the last things that gets done is the title. And the title is a bit of a workshop, maybe even haggling between writer, 
press and advisors and Freeberg talking to him. So he said, practice is the thing. Why not have that as the leader title? And like, oh, right, that makes sense. Um, so first start out with that shout out to Chris Freeberg. Um, but you're right about citizenship. This is pre 14th amendment, which um, there is a federal statute around citizenship in the Articles of Confederation. Um, and there's a federal statute around birthright citizenship in the 14th Amendment. But between the two, we don't really have a kind of consistent U.S. citizen equals X, Y, Z. And one of the things that struck me when I was just reading Black work and spending time in the Black abolitionist papers, for instance, or um, the collective proceedings of the Black state conventions, it's all this talk about citizenship. And I'm just assuming, like the question, um, I'm just assuming that citizenship wasn't something that black folk had access to. So I was confused. Like how, on what terms can you understand yourself as a citizen? So I started reviewing the legal history, um, which is a fascinating briar patch. And the only answer I could come up with was from the state's position is it depends by state, by year, um, by, um, by judicial inclination. So at various points, for instance, in Pennsylvania, black men could vote until 1838. And if we make the case that voting is fundamental to being a citizenship, that suggests that at least black men were citizens. Black people had passports. Um, they sued under the Privileges and Immunities Clause, you know, all this stuff. So it's just to me that if anybody, to the extent that anybody could claim being a citizen, Black folks could. Henry Highland Garnett even says um, to enslaved folk, you are citizens and you have a right to strike. Um, so really elastic understanding. So what I began doing um, is thinking less about, okay, how is the law defining black people as citizens and how are black citizens then responding to the law and thinking more about how are black people defining citizenship and further how are their definitions and actions based on their understanding of themselves as citizens forcing states and legal and state laws and federal laws to change pennsylvania's law didn't change because um someone said, oh, I forgot, Black people shouldn't be able to vote. Black people voted. Somebody sued. Um, the delegates, some of the delegates to the state convention realized it would be politically advantageous to them to have Black folks be disenfranchised. Uh, and so throughout, we see Black people doing the things that build community, doing citizenship work. And this is the argument they make. We are citizens because we were born here. We have a birthright. We fought in the wars. We do political participation, and even when you disenfranchise us, we're holding state conventions and national conventions to engage in the political process. We're doing all this stuff. We are citizens, whether or not the state recognizes us. So that's the long, short version. Sorry about that. I have one more question to ask. This actually came from... Uh, uh, a couple of grad students uh, via email who could not be here today. I wanted to make sure uh, 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 some of their questions were answered, but one in particular was just seeking advice and counsel on how you get started, how you uh, uh, get started in the archives, how you organize uh, your research. Um, so if you could maybe just talk a little bit about your process in, in researching and writing this book and, and maybe kind of how it evolved over time? That's a good question. Um, getting started, footnotes and bibliographies. They are gold mines. That's where the action is. Um, this is where I figured out where things were and what things were important, um, especially for graduate students in particular. Um, my graduate advisors allowed me to add the Black abolitionist papers, um, the collective proceedings of the Black state conventions and the national conventions. It allowed me to add newspapers to my exam reading list. Um, so as a part of my exam process, I just sat with these documents, these compendia, 
um, and read and took notes and then tracked them down. And so getting started involves a lot of reading. Um, it's not it's sort of magical appeal. It's a lot of reading, a lot of free writing, structured free writing to process ideas. So starting the day with free writing, ending the day with free writing, asking questions of the reading, and then talking to people. Uh, I, as a graduate student, reading Francis Harper's fancy sketches in the Anglo-African, read an essay by Carla Peterson, and I've told this story many times now. Um, but being a grad graduate student and deep in the work, I emailed Professor Carla Peterson asking for the resource, and she was kind enough to respond. So just reaching out to people, meeting people at conferences, um, small grants, even if it's just enough to go for a week to a place like an Aquarian Society library company, is great because even if you can't necessarily get a lot of archive work done in that week, you meet people, including archivists, other people doing the research um, at your local institution, get to know the archivists, the catalogers, um, library staff. I, it's a lot of on the one hand, very much being alone, reading and writing and following the footnote trails. And on the other hand, talking to people, exchanging ideas and exchanging sources. So that's it. Day by day, hour by hour, sometimes 10 minute increment by 10 minute increment. That's terrific. <laughs> uh, I, I do want to get to a couple of the questions in the Q&A, and I do want to thank everybody for using the chat. I'm, I'm still going through the chat here. It's absolutely incredible uh, what's been kind of stirring under there. Uh, first, uh, we have Nazira Wright's question. Derek, I don't know if you can see the Q&A yourself, um, but uh, essentially uh, Nazira is asking if you could speak more about how black writers and, and activists uh, used uh, identifiable texts um, uh, to subvert meaning and to insist on black citizenship and democracy. Oh, De sorry, Derek. <laughs> yeah, it happens at least once. Um, oh, that's a good question. I, it, and I like the reference to Murray's grammar is fun because I was just teaching Walker's Appeal um, this past semester in the grad seminar. And if you look at the way Walker uses punctuation, exclamation points, question marks, and then you go back to Murray's grammar, he's following the grammar book. Like you can see <laughs> um, if you just read the way that Murray talks about question marks and the way to punctuate questions that aren't really questions, and then go back and read David Walker's Oh My God moments, he's going by the book, literally. Um, Another piece of this would be the way Jones and Allen used the parable of the Good Samaritan. Uh, and it helps to go back and read contemporaneous Bible commentaries because Jones and Allen's interpretation, or at least my interpretation of Jones and Allen's use of that parable goes, aligns directly with the way Jonathan Edwards talks about charity and sensibility, the way Benjamin Rush talks about it, the way it gets Burkett um, breaks down the exegesis of the parable of the Good Samaritan. All of these sources talk about neighborliness and that parable as articulating a principle of law and as saying that charity is not an emotion, is not sort of benevolence, it is a principle. One acts on neighborliness whether or not you feel like it. Um, and doing that, tracing those sort of parallel texts, the way Jones and Allen, Banneker, um, Walker, they're using these sources in full knowledge that their readers also know these sources. These are intellectuals. They're leveraging the intellectual traditions available to them, and they're counting on their readers to catch up. Like, I'm, I'm just imagining when folks read that scene um, that I talk about from Jones and Allen's narrative, um, how could you not, if you go to Sunday school, like, know judgment on anybody, not recognize the parable of the Good Samaritan in that. It is right there. Um, so that's what I think. They are definitely using the sources available and they're, um, they're claiming them as their own. They're not claiming them as outsiders. They're not intellectual outsiders. They're saying this is 
we own this language and we're going to use it in the ways that we see fit. Terrific. Um, I, I know we're, we're running short on time. Jerry, I see your question and I'm actually going to save yours for the very end. Um, uh, we have maybe two quick questions we could get to, Derek. Uh, first, uh, Gabrielle Foreman asks the question, black literacy or black print circuits? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's a question I tried to answer for, um, well, someone I was supposed to be convincing to give money who just could not believe that black people enslaved black people read or had access to literacy. And I think I start with Elizabeth, Elizabeth McHenry's great work, which gets us thinking not, necess, not just in terms of reading directly, but literate culture. Um, people with access to print, people with access to people who read to them, et cetera, et cetera. Walker talks about this in the appeal. If you can't read my appeal, have someone read it to you. Um, uh, Harriet Jacobs describes a man who asks her to teach her how to read. Um, you read William Steele's Underground Railroad, and he has people writing to him who are currently enslaved. So we have actual documentation of enslaved people reading and writing. Um, so literate culture is key. And lit by literate culture, I don't just, I don't mean to sort of fetishize the printed word. There is a very thin line between print and orality and the book and embodiment. Um, these texts were written with an eye towards performance. Walker's appeal, again, with the uh, punctuation. The state and national color conventions were meant to be read aloud. The appeals and petitions meant to be read aloud. Uh, and so things start in conversation and committees and debates. They get printed and circulated. They get read and reread and snippeted and sort of um, cut and reperformed and recycled, and it goes on and on in a kind of cyclical sort of way. But yeah, circuits, I just noticed the circuits, very important, um, both nationally and internationally. Um, two more questions, I think. Uh, the first uh, is uh, in regards to, to your own work uh, on African-American print culture. Um, the question is, uh, do you see or have you seen any distinction in how African-American men and women activists define citizenship? Uh, the shorthand version is that the men often don't include the women, or at least don't think to. Um, the New York um, state conventions, for instance, explicitly define voting and citizenship as manhood rights. Um, Garnett, for instance, says, um, we do this because we are men, fathers, brothers, husbands, etc." cetera. Um, the women delegates, or not delegates, um, attendees to these conventions, women writers like Harper, Jarena Lee, talk about citizenship in terms of a practice too. And they do so in, what, in, in the kind of, um, way that employs the strategies Jones and Allen and Walker employ back on the both of black men and white folks. And so they take the language of the conventions. Um, and in the case of the Ohio State Conventions, they say literally, look, we're not going to do another thing for this convention until you recognize us. Um, and they put pressure on that again and again and again and again. Um, Francis Harper, will critique again and again um, gatherings that have no problem recognizing black women um, for fundraising purposes, but nothing else. And in fancy sketches, she has this sketch where she, the protagonist dreams of an anti-sunshine anti society, like acronym, an ass society that won't allow women to vote. Like she, and she talks about black men talking about black women as engaging in tomfoolery. So when we get to the brass tacks of citizenship as a practice, black women are right there. They're more incisive than black men because when you read many of black men, 
they're thinking about citizenship as a male enterprise, even though black women are the backbone of how citizenship is actually getting practiced. Shout out to Jarena Lee. Just read Jarena Lee. All right, uh, I think this is gonna be the last question of the day. And um, this is in regards to uh, how we really kind of think about uh, what great, I'm actually I'm just gonna quote you directly here from, from your talk here. Um, just a bunch of phrases I jotted down. Apparatus theory, meaning making, and the tactical deployment of print. And I have kind of in the center of those three items this word neighborliness, which I absolutely love throughout your book um, and, and how that's used. Uh, and I think it's tied directly to uh, the previous question about this shift from orality to print and essentially how folks were, both individuals and collectives were thinking about and creating structures, both in the abstract kind of intellectual way, but also in the practical everyday business side of things uh, on right, creating, uh, creating a press, creating a text, creating a venue for dialogue, training individuals to uh, not just read, but participate in those rhetorical strategies. And as we kind of begin to just enter the digital realm, whatever that might mean, uh, and we probably won't know for another century, right? Uh, but as we kind of begin to kind of dip our toe into the electronic age, what maybe, what strategies could we best, uh, could, you know, be deployed to prepare us for the electronic? What lessons could be learned from your book uh, that might be applied for the generations to come? And that's... <laughs> It's a good question, and I'm going to try to tie in some of what I'm seeing happening in the Q&A um, box, too, um, because you asked about um, the way print works and the relation between that and so digital platforms, now new media, right? And you can sort of track from, let's say, Phyllis Wheatley's um, poetry all the way up now to Black Twitter. Um, Black activists, Black artists, Black intellectuals are always on the cutting edge of communication. Like, sort of by any means necessary because it's often for them, it's often for them a matter of life and death, but also I'm reminded of what Francis Smith Foster reminds us. It's like they're doing this because they want to talk about, talk to themselves about stuff that matters to them. Um, be it love or making fun of each other. When you read the synonymous writing in Frederick Douglass's paper, Communipod, Ethiop, Cosmopolite, Fanny Homewood. They're talking about serious weighty matters. They're also making fun of people. They're making fun of themselves. They're talking about the culture, like broadly trying to understand the, the culture in this weekly, daily space with pseudonyms that, like I'm writing about this now, um, look a lot like Twitter handles. Like there is a similar dynamic and it's kind of weird. I had a hard time teaching that in David Walker's appeal before Twitter and Facebook, but now students get it because the, 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 the dynamism of it is there. They had to be fast on their feet because one year from one year to the next, the conditions of black life in the United States could change dramatically. Just imagine waking up one day to the Fugitive Slave Act waking up the next day to the Kansas-Nebraska Act, waking up the next day to Dred Scott v. Sanford, waking up the next day to the Civil War. Like you have to be quick on your feet, right? Um, and this gets to sort of their relationship to this technology. It was really important when you look at the conventions, for instance, that there be a black press. And by black press, they're talking about newspapers, but they're also talking about ownership of the means of production. So not just newspapers, but the means to print the newspapers, train editors, printers, distribution agents, distribution networks. Um, because again and again, you see black intellectuals saying, we can't depend on these white owned spaces to get it right. Um, more, even if and when white spaces get it right, they, they get all the credit. So even if 
even if and when we work under the auspices of the American Anti-Slavery Society. Doing great work, great, but do we see any Black people in leadership, right? Um, as the constant tension and problem, so trying to find independent media to work through. Um, the neighborliness piece of this, trying to tie these things together, and I see a question about um, the relationship between what I'm doing and, and humanity discourse. Um, I use the word neighborliness, and I don't necessarily talk about humanity, but I'm not averse to the term, partly because I'm reading 19th century Black writing, and I don't want to foist so 21st century understandings of concepts onto them in ways that foreclose my ability to understand what they're doing in the work. It's one. Two, I'm really hesitant to cede useful terms to the extent that I can make them useful to anybody um, and to take sort of European understandings of a concept as the end all be all of that concept. So neighborliness, for instance, right? Um, I'd see someone noted, I think in the Q&A box, like that's a concept that we see resonating with the Puritans. I mentioned Jonathan Edwards talks about it. Um, Biblical commentaries talk about it. You also see um, traditions of mutual aid in West African contexts, Caribbean contexts. When you look at the people who were at the fore of Black activism, especially in the early 19th century, many of them had multiple routes that did not begin in the United States. So we're not just talking about sort of Western philosophical traditions and understandings of something like neighborliness or mutual aid. Um, we're talking about understandings that are developed through readings of things like the King James Bible, through readings of people like Jonathan Edwards, also through experiences of enslavement, also through interfaces with folks whose journey took them through the Caribbean or from West African, West Africa through the Caribbean to the United States. And all of that's coming together and being sort of tweaked and modified, and which is why I like Samuel Ringo Ward's concept of seeing things through a different medium, that experience of being black in a particular space at a particular time shapes these concepts. So I hope that gets at, and I find that a really unsatisfactory way to tie some of these questions together, but I hope that at least gets at some of what's percolating in the Q&A. I think it's the beginning of a, of a great conversation that has been happening and, and will continue to happen. So. Uh, I'd like to thank, first off, Derek, <laughs> Derek Spires, thank you for joining us today. Um, can we get some thank more you. Hand claps and <laughs> virtual, virtual thanks. Um, thank you, Derek. And uh, I would like to thank each of you for attending. Uh, in a couple of weeks, we will announce uh, the subject of the next talk. So I hope uh, to continue uh, to promote the series uh, two weeks prior uh, to the event throughout the summer. Uh, we'll have a full program set up in the fall, so please check that out. Uh, in the chat box, uh, remember to check out uh, future AAS programs and to please sign up for our mailing list. So thank you all for being here today. Uh, Till next time, thank you, Derek, and thank all of you. Thanks, everyone.